Look, he's coming in late. Hi, everyone. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, it's a pleasure to see you all here. Uh, and it's a, a great pleasure of mine to introduce our speaker today, Moritz Kramer. Uh, Moritz is a computational biologist and data scientist, uh, and he's currently a Branko Weiss Fellow in the Department of Zoology here in uh, Oxford. Uh, Moritz um, uh, studied, his, his, uh, or studied for a PhD here in Oxford, and then worked uh, in Harvard University before coming back to Oxford to continue his research. Uh, uh, Moritz works on a large number of different questions relating to infectious disease, but today he'll be talking about uh, some new results uh, that uh, you uh, have just been published, and you can find out about them on the university website, uh, concerning um, the uh, predicted spread of vectors, mosquito-borne vectors of infectious disease. And particularly, th this is an interesting problem that lies at the intersection of, of both climate change and emerging infectious disease. Um, so, uh, with no further ado, uh, Morris, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Oli. Um, this is my first talk that's filmed, so it's very exciting for me as much uh, uh, as for maybe some others in the room. Um, so yeah, I'll be speaking about some very new results, actually, uh, that only were published yesterday, um, doing some global maps of the spread of arboviruses uh, and their vectors, especially Aedes aegypti and Aedes albopictus. And I'm talking a little bit through the rationale, uh, why we want to do global maps, uh, why that's relevant, and how that can sort of inform some of the work that we want to hopefully do in the future as well. So the main motivation to doing uh, sort of global maps for us was uh, once because we are just increasingly more connected today than we were uh, in previous times. Uh, and I think I want to always contrast this to sort of a travel time map from 1881, which here shows for, from London the time it takes to travel to, to new places. Uh, and in green showing areas that are sort of 10 days away and sort of orange areas that are 40 days away. And as you can imagine, now you can all hop on a plane in Heathrow and you're going to be out in Perth, Australia in like maybe 15 hours or so. So that increases, of course, uh, the potential for the spread of uh, novel emerging infectious diseases. Uh, and here's just a map showing at one given time point how many flights there are actually in the world uh, in the sky at the time, at one time during, during a weekday. Um, and of course, as we all know, diseases or vectors or any biological organisms don't really want to respect country borders, so they don't really care about that phenomenon of, of, of country borders uh, as it stands. Um, and two like, really striking examples of that was the 2003 uh, SARS epidemic uh, shown here on the left-hand side. Uh, there was one spillover event in southern China that then spread quickly to Hong Kong. Uh, there spread to multiple people, and within a week or so uh, was across the globe, affecting millions of people um, across the world. Uh, it didn't affect in terms of infect uh, millions of people, but was in areas it could have spread to, to millions of, uh, of individuals. Um, and more recently, this was in 2003, we have the Zika epidemic, and you must have heard all about that kind of spreading uh, from its first discovery in 1947 in Uganda, uh, over like lingering around Asia for a while, and then with large epidemics in Polynesia, with uh, a jump into the Americas where it caused a big pandemic uh, between 2013 and 2016, rapidly spreading throughout the Americas, mostly originating from northeastern uh, Brazil. Um, further, uh, we have um, sort of like knowingly from Zika, we knew that there's lots of errors. We don't actually know what's really going on. And this is a sort of current debate still for Asia, for example, where we don't really know how much transmission there actually occurred, which leads me on to like sort of the next set of motivations, which is filling in gaps of areas where we actually don't have much information. So these are sort of areas where, uh, as you can see up here, for example, we don't have many observations of Aedes aegypti mosquitoes, for example. Um, this is a mosquito that transmits dengue, Zika, chikungunya, and yellow fever viruses. Uh, and as you can see, like lots of distribution around sort of the Americas, 
are like really, really little known in Central, Central Africa. But we do know that there's also transmission of some of these viruses. So can we use sort of all information collated from the across the globe to make better inferences and predictions about areas we don't have observations, especially in areas that are um, low and middle income countries where not much money is spent, for example, um, on surveillance and control of either infectious disease or even uh, their vectors. Um, what it also helps us with is build comparable maps. So if I build a global map, I actually can compare areas to each other. So it's not just something that I do for one little tiny area, but actually I can compare something that's happening in Brazil to something that's happening somewhere else uh, on the globe. And these estimates become something that we can contrast and even derive sort of estimates of how many resources we should spend to these new locations. And this has led us to sort of you know, partner with agencies like NASA, for example, that provide satellite imagery for us that are globally comprehensive. Uh, and as you can see here, there's just like an image of these satellites like circulating uh, around the world. Um, we do these maps at a five kilometer, five kilometer resolution. So we don't do this on a country level, but we are very, very interested in understanding how these things are at a high spatial resolution. And as we all know, things differ within each country. And this is a striking example here of the Zika epidemic in the Americas, uh, shown very early on in 2016, uh, when it, we just heard about Zika virus in the Americas. And WHO, PAHO, and other global agencies put out these sort of global maps, country-wide assessments of where circulation is actually occurring. As you can see, these estimates that are built on just one single country, if there's a report, they say, yes, there's a report, and we highlight this as a Zika-affected place. Um, and this has led to lots of travel warnings, for example, that were given out from the US government, okay, not to go to certain countries. And there was even reimbursements that were being offered if uh, people didn't want to go to affected areas anymore. However, lots of governments came actually back and said, hey, um, but you know, there's places in our country where actually we don't have any transmission, so what do we do about those? So we went in and actually said, well, let's do these assessments on a much higher spatial resolution where we can differentiate, even within one country, how risk is differing. And what you can see here, for example, is Mexico City popping out, which is an area laying very high where we didn't actually see any transmission of Zika and where the occurrence of Aedes aegypti and mosquitoes that transmit these viruses is extremely low. Um, so we could revise kind of these country estimates down to sort of a five kilometer gridded element, which provides sort of our rationale for doing sort of high computational, higher computational intense maps of five kilometer resolution. If you go further down, it gets incredibly complex to actually build these global maps because computational power is just not there at the moment. Um, sort of how do we do these maps? Just to give you a little bit of an idea of how this process actually works. Uh, and this is just sort of exemplified in this one example. Uh, is we go from sort of a, an understanding of definite extent, and this is mostly on a country level, and this is information that we can really gain from the public health agencies. And here you see sort of a consensus sort of map for comprehensively consensus for Africa, collating all the information from country reports, understanding in how far there is complete absence or presence of the uh, pathogen that we're looking at. So we take that sort of as a first go at understanding its global distribution. We then go to sort of the level down and really collate on a very, very high resolution the information about reports of disease. And in that case, we would actually go in and read all of the available literature and geocode all of the information from countries down to the level of five kilometer, five kilometer, which is also the level we wanted to pair those estimates with our covariates. So to build these five kilometer maps. Then we create some pseudo absence points. I'm not going to go into too much detail of that. Put this all together in a big machine learning model with some environmental covariates that we have found to exemplify um, and predict the occurrence of these diseases. What comes out is sort of a predictive risk map, which is stratified a global map uh, where each of the grid cells represent sort of a, an estimate of what the probability of uh, a transmission event could be. And I'm going to run you through the example of the Aedes mosquitoes because that's going to be sort of the example I'll present today mostly. Um, this mosquito is now available on all continents um, and is like kind of renowned as the most important invasive disease vector. It's spreading vastly across the globe. Uh, it has initially sort of 
gone from West Africa all the way to all other continents, has been eradicated briefly from the Americas, uh, but then reinvaded the Americas, and it's now present mostly on all continents, except Antarctica, of course, because it's a bit too cold. Um, you mostly find this mosquito in urban um, habitats adapted to the urban environment, so it uh, very much likes human environments, it very much likes to bite humans as well. So here, just around houses in Los Angeles, we found a bunch of the eggs and adult mosquitoes in these, um, in these containers around houses, and especially also used tires. Um, um, and this is sort of an effort that, for example, in Los Angeles is being done uh, when there's an imported case of, of yellow fever, Zika, chikungunya, or, uh, or, uh, or dengue, where people go around house to collect mosquitoes uh, where people have been infected. Uh, what comes out is these risk maps, really, and this is here shown overlaying the points where we have observations with points with the underlying surface of predicted risk. Um, and what you can see here, for example, for the United States is there's lots of holes in there where we don't have black dots, but we do have red, right? And red means higher risk of finding this mosquito. Uh, and, and we believe, and this kind of interestingly follows like the state borders. So these are areas where basically the state didn't put the money in to collect the mosquitoes. So we can sort of identify those sort of surveillance holes, essentially, that then become relevant for us to understand, well, even though there's no report, we do anticipate that we find mosquitoes in those locations. Similarly, we find very nice overlaying evidence that we can predict very well the locations where we find mosquitoes, especially here uh, with the red, with the uh, black dots in, in Europe. And we have the triangles here, which are imported um, Aedes albopictus mosquitoes up further north throughout up to Rotterdam, but they're not permanent populations in those locations. Um, obviously, like this is not just done sort of on a um, North America or Europe level, but we can do this globally, and this is here now shown for Aedes aegypti. But I mean, I still want to say this is a static map. This provides static evidence for one given time point uh, in 2015 and represents the current distribution in 2015 when we published this paper, which at that point was the best predicted map of, uh, of the species. And of course, doing that also here for Aedes albopictus, where the range is much more northwards than for contrasting Aedes aegypti, which is much more tropical and subtropical vector. Um, however, this is something that we do on a static level. We want to sort of improve upon that and do real-time mapping of these vectors, but also of uh, the diseases they transmit. So we collated information from sort of social media sources here, adding in Facebook, Twitter, and other means that we use on a daily basis, um, and sort of try to produce sort of real-time estimates and updates on these maps. So we partnered with HealthMap, where I was at Harvard for two years, um, to sort of provide sort of an, a mapping of the new locations where we may have mosquito or disease presence with the underlying risk map in 2015. And this is a paper we wrote about Zika virus where a similar methodology was used. And this was very early in the epidemic in March 2016, where we only see really four selected points down here in northeastern Brazil. Fast forward in July, all over the place. But now, this is, provides something very interesting for us because it provides us with the ability to say there's an environmental risk map that underlies this, which is the red down here, and there's dots popping up somewhere in the gray areas. So we were wondering, okay, what is this about? Like, there's people just reporting on Twitter potentially, okay, well, there's something actually happening, there's transmission happening. No, we can actually illustrate through these real-time maps and updates and using these digital technologies like Twitter and Facebook that these locations are actually locations where people have been maybe coming back from an endemic area and report disease when they're coming back, but the risk of local transmission is extremely low. So this provides sort of us with the ability to communicate directly um, on a website with people on the ground uh, that there is actually no risk for onward transmission uh, of vector-borne transmission of Zika virus in that context. And you can also like sort of sort of tick Egypta albopictus maps in here or the environmental suitability map for, for Zika virus. So different layers sort of, of evidence of transmission. And then you can also go back in history and sort of play this video forward, really. I don't have the video here on my computer now, where you can see sort of the evolution 
of how people are reporting in real time the transmission and the discussions online around, uh, around uh, disease. And we have uh, done this not just for, for, for Zika and the, and the mosquito vectors, but also for other related viruses here for chikungunya shown for the Americas, Zika risk map as I, as I mentioned, and down here yellow fever. So this is a widely applicable method that we can use and apply not just to one pathogen, but it's a system of models that we can actually use to do so for any other disease that has a strong sort of environmental driver of transmission. Um, however, we're looking into the future, we're looking at things that are changing, um, and we know that these vectors and diseases really like urban environments. So here we see sort of unplanned urbanization. Uh, this is actually a picture from Hong Kong, and this is the view at the time when I was living in Hong Kong in 2000, and I think it was 11, um, um, outside my building, and this was also the area where actually SARS was first and initially transmitted. So that got me a little bit into the idea of, you know, that urbanization, people living together in crowded environments, actually matters in terms of disease transmission. And another process that we obviously know uh, is happening at the moment is like kind of climatic changes that are occurring in regards to um, warming climates, precipitation, and so forth. Um, so we took the attempt to say, well, we need to include those elements to go forward and try to sort of map out how these vector distributions may change in the future. And essentially, uh, as I mentioned, combining not just the information about the environment that I mentioned was previously very important, but also including aspects of population mobility, urbanization, and how people behave in these environments and how they're living together. Um, and there is like growing evidence that this is actually something that is occurring at the moment. So this is um, starting from a paper in 1997, really, Aedes aegypti has expanded massively around the highway networks in the United States after its introduction. You see the sort of dots appearing here along the highway lines. Uh, later on in Panama along the highway network, you see increasing sort of expansion of Aedes aegypti mosquitoes. This is here shown from 2002, 2000 and 13, and the red dots representing um, the Aedes aegypti occurrences. And then we have sort of real-time tools to monitor the expansion of these vectors in California, here shown in red areas. And then we have the areas in green showing areas that are under surveillance but have not yet reported Aedes aegypti mosquitoes. And this is done by a collaborator of mine, Chris Parker, in the United States and California here especially. Um, so we took that evidence and said, well, can we find sort of quantitative models to explain this invasion process uh, because we want to understand how this may evolve over the next coming decades. Um, so we tabulated in time the available information that we had from the US and from Europe. So we see here from 1987, 2016, the US map with lighter blue colors, the earlier occurrences, and then darker sort of purple-ish the latest sort of occurrences and observations of Aedes albopictus. And you can kind of see there's some sort of spatial gradient going northwards uh, with some sort of residual uh, also observations happening here later in the process, but sort of a northward expansion. Um, we see something very similar and indeed interesting in Europe. So here you see the earliest observation happening in um, southern Italy and then sort of spreading around towards the Alps into France and up northwards, where it's been found recently. Even like one observation in Kent, I don't know if you've heard about this, but Aedes albopictus now also been found, not as an established population, but as an introduction in Kent. Uh, and here for Aedes aegypti is shown for the United States as well, much wider distribution in terms of its geographical scope, but more scars in terms of, sparse in terms of like how far it is continuing up northwards. So when we do the, like sort of put a mathematical model on this, we can actually map out how quickly the front has been expanding. Um, and we see this here quite nicely that for the United States, the expansion is kind of like tabled. So it's kind of expanded really rapidly, but then now it's kind of at a constant rate of expansion. Whereas in Europe, we see an increasing rate of expansion of Aedes albopictus, which we attribute really to the vector overcoming the Alps. So once the vector has overcome the barrier of the Alps, which is cold and where the vector can actually not survive, it spreads very rapidly northwards into southern Germany, but also up here now with observations in, for example, Paris. 
Um, but this is not the entire picture, right? The entire picture is not just like how it's been expanding and how that may be driven by human mobility. We also need to take into account, of course, what's happening around um, and the climate and how the climate has evolved over that period. So this is kind of just a flow chart of the model that we have done. I'm not going to go into too much detail. I just want to highlight that we have used all 17 available global climate circulation models, have done uh, three out of the four representative concentration pathway scenarios, um, one, and I'm going to go into a little bit of more detail uh, in the next slide, and sort of pad that up with all of our observation that we had historically. Um, there's probably other people who know much, much more about the uh, RCPs than I do, but I'm just going to highlight in this graph a little bit um, how they sort of play out into the future. So there's the very, very, you know, the, the good scenario that we are sort of reducing our CO2 emissions very quickly. I think we already passed this scenario. I think it's not actually uh, possible anymore. Um, so that's why we modeled only RCP 4.56 and 8.5, which different sort of peaking of the emissions in 2050 and 2060, and, 20, and then the most pessimistic scenario really being the 8.5, where we will continue to emit a lot of greenhouse gases into the future. Um, the other element that was important in this context to move forward was understanding how humans behave and how humans move between different locations, especially that we are urbanizing, we are urbanizing especially in low and middle income countries and how are people increasingly connected between each pair of locations. So we're looking here just as an example for Angola and the DRC where you see the width of the arrow representing sort of the connections between each of those locations. Um, we extracted these using basically all available information that we had globally based on either mobile phone data, um, we had commuting data that was available for the United States, for example, and there was uh, available information from sort of location-based services like Twitter and other uh, services where we can reconstruct kind of the behavior of people and the movements of people. And we put this all together kind of in a model and the probability of spread then becomes a function of all of these elements together. And that, these elements being the climate, the movements between locations and the distances between the locations that we have observation and where we have no observations. Um, we then evaluated our model on the past, so we used historic data to understand how good we are in predicting actually the expansion of these viruses. So here we just show like a few of those and taking different time points in the past, so just using like three years of data, predicting the rest of the data, or using 10 years of the data, and we're consistently doing relatively well in predicting well the expansion of the, of the, of the vectors. We're not doing so well in Europe, just because we don't have that much of observations there. We have like only 169 uh, compared to like 1,300 in the United States. Um, however, we are still doing above average in terms of in how good we are in predicting the future distribution of these, of these viruses. Um, and this is just showing you a little bit of insight. I don't know if you can see this really well uh, on how this may evolve going forward. So here, for example, shown for Aedes aegypti in 2050, you see sort of an invasion that's happening more sort of in a jump fashion. So the Aedes aegypti mosquitoes are going to new urban areas uh, outside their current distribution, but not so much just radiating around where they are into rural areas. And this picture is very different for Aedes albopictus. So here you see the sort of wave front expansion, we call it, where you see kind of continuous expansion happening along the fringes of its current distribution. And we can also see that in actually the model where the distance model, which is just purely based on distance and not any model assumptions about human mobility, is doing much more poorly for Aedes aegypti compared to Aedes albopictus. Um, and this is based on the assumption that Aedes aegypti wants to be with people, it wants to be in areas where humans live, it wants to uh, bite humans much more uh, than Aedes albopictus, for example, which is a much more rural vector. Um, however, we are able to predict the invasion pattern of uh, Aedes aegypti really, really well using other types of mobility models, but we could kind of see those mathematically accounted for within these model structures, and we're not going to bother you with too much more math at this point. And then when we predict this globally uh, into the future, we see here for 2050 uh, the predicted global distribution. So most of the expansion happening for Egypti is within already existing areas, sort of in tropical, subtropical areas, but also into many more parts of southern China, for example, and also bits of northern, uh, northern United States. We don't predict too much spread into Europe, 
uh, which is mainly based on the reservoir, so we don't have that many Egypti around Europe, uh, that we don't anticipate there's too much importation pressure on Europe, whereas that's very different for Aedes albopictus. Uh, in contrast, we see massive expansion in northern latitudes in the United States, and for example here also northern China, which increases the population at risk in these areas where we have massive population in urban centers uh, that could potentially be at risk in the future of arboviral transmission. Um, with these model structures, we're also able to account for the underlying uncertainty that's inherent within these models. Um, and I'm not going to go into too much detail, but I'm just going to highlight that there is areas, especially on the fringes of its distribution, where we don't have much observation, where our estimates are more uncertain than in areas where we are relatively certain about the mosquito actually being, being there. To conclude on just the side of the Aedes aegypti mosquito, before I go into the next example, is that they are continuing their march and expansion around the globe. Um, we were able, using historic information, to accurately predict the spread and geographic invasion pattern of these, of these vectors using slightly different types of models. Um, in that case, Aedes aegypti is much more dominated to spread by long distance introductions, whereas Aedes albopictus is much more radiating around its current distribution. Um, another highlight being that under any climatic conditions into the future, these mosquitoes are going to continue to uh, go and affect new areas. So um, we can just curb the sort of expansion over the next 50 or 80 years uh, by reducing greenhouse gas emission in that context. So most of the things that we learned in the process of sort of mapping out these sort of large expansion patterns of these, uh, of these, of these vectors um, is also possible to do that in the context of outbreak response. So um, we have seen, as I showed in, in the beginning in the early slides, that there's massive sort of um, new outbreaks are happening um, around the world, really, uh, from you know, yellow fever in Brazil to, to Angola. On the other hand, Zika virus in the uh, in the Americas, um, and here the Angola, Angolan yellow fever outbreak, where we applied a similar model to in real time try to understand how Zika is, uh, how yellow fever is spreading, and then how far we can prevent that disease of spreading further because it's vaccine preventable. So the last big outbreak was in the 1980s. Uh, so we were a bit surprised that actually such a large outbreak that we have seen in Angola uh, would occur again given that uh, we could vaccinate people against disease. Um, it also spread across the border from Angola into the DRC, mostly by people who worked in Angola and then went over to the DRC and imported the virus. There was little onward transmission only reported in Kinshasa especially. Um, we had, in the end, a total of 7,300 suspected cases with over 400 deaths. And uh, using just classical epidemiological models, we were able to sort of map out the transmission potential of yellow fever in that context, which uh, was then estimated at an R0 of like uh, 3.5, which is relatively high, but also consistent with estimates of yellow fever transmission beforehand. Um, you can see here, interestingly, most of the cases happen actually in the capital. So red represents Luanda province and blue represents all other provinces. So most of the transmission really occurred in the capital city. But it quickly expanded along um, uh, during the outbreak up to like 30 to 35 um, different locations being affected at any given time. Um, and how that looks spatially is very different and just like many other outbreaks, it sort of went from Luanda very quickly down here to Huambo province, uh, where most of the cases were then subsequently being reported. So darker purple indicating earlier arrival of the pathogen versus lighter color later arrival of the pathogen. And we were just interested in sort of the spread pattern of um, yellow fever uh, during, that, during that outbreak. And then also we were interested in like the longevity of the outbreak. So how long did the virus actually stay in each of those locations, and what can we do to prevent uh, future, future uh, cases to, to occur. Uh, and this was then uh, done in collaboration with the World Health Organization to sort of guide around sort of surveillance strategies and also implementation of vaccine uh, delivery. And we used a relatively simple mathematical model to try to sort of, with the main aim, to understand how quickly uh, and where and when 
is a yellow fever going to invade this, this uh, a new location? And how can we prevent, ultimately, that new arrival? Uh, for doing so, we used a very similar model to the model I showed earlier, um, which is taking into account the mobility of people between locations, but also sort of the ecological factors, and those being, in this case, the ADC dry mosquito suitability maps that I sort of presented very early in this talk. And by doing so, um, just showing you kind of the, the demographics of the area. You have here Luanda with high population sizes and Huambo as well. And then along this corridor, uh, much of the population living around Kinshasa. So you have here again sort of the connectivity between locations. And similarly here shown for Luanda and then this high population corridor around Huambo and Lobito province. So we were really interested in sort of where is it going to go? Can we predict where it's going to go? And how can we really best intervene? Uh, in these places. Um, and the main target was, okay, well, if we had money to distribute vaccines, how good would we be doing with a real-time model in preventing uh, new cases to occur? So this is assuming that we can target 50 districts. Um, and if we ranked our districts that we think are going to be invaded, how many would we get right for vaccination strategies? Uh, we ultimately concluded that we would have been able to provide evidence for 30 to be invaded out of the 32 that eventually became invaded in the region. Um, provide sort of, you know, the possibility to using these tools also in real time during, during outbreaks. And then we can run these also forward, and this is very similar to the model for the, for the mosquito vectors, where we can sort of look at the remaining cases and where they may pop up going forward. And this is a sort of spatially stratified model, really, where we can sort of put out the risk probability of invasion um, in the future. Um, these types of models have now been automated, so we have been able to sort of use those types of tools um, to automate, uh, for example, for the, for the Ebola outbreak at the time, um, how many cases we would observe going forward and how many locations becoming in, uh, potentially invaded. So this is one of the uh, active research areas that we are working on to try to sort of um, use these types of tools, but use them as sort of data comes through and as outbreaks do occur. Uh, similarly, many of the maps that we used were now sort of included in policy documents uh, to anticipate sort of virus spread uh, or control strategies for especially Zika virus, um, and sort of based on these AZ Egypta maps, and we hope to continue that collaboration going forward. Um, and also adapt those kind of strategies when it comes to sort of newly uh, changing conditions. So in this case, the Venezuelan crisis and the recent sort of review around spillover uh, of potential resurgence of, yellow f um, of, of vector-borne diseases in the region. So how can we kind of use such tools, adapt them in real time to changing environments to then sort of map out how, um, how, for example, vector-borne diseases may spread based on these uh, new conditions. Um, and then, of course, there is like kind of like more ways of thinking about this um, sort of going forward. So one would be we need to build better tools for people to contribute to such, to such maps. So how can we sort of uh, allow people to contribute with either data points or any other uh, sort of evidence they have from the ground, really, to update these maps in real time? Um, there's also the possibility to include detailed genomic data to increase, uh, in, increase our temporal resolution uh, of the sort of historic patterns of, of, of invasion of, of uh, either vectors or arboviruses. And uh, this led to a bunch of collaborations even within Oxford. Um, we just don't have at this point in time the sample at this high um, spatial resolution, but we'll hopefully do so in the future. And then, as I mentioned earlier, we are now confined to sort of a five kilometer resolution because that just provides our ability to produce these maps in real time. However, uh, if we improved upon these algorithms, we may be able to actually do that um, on a daily rate at a higher resolution, like a kilometer level or even going further down. Um, with that, I'm going to just highlight that all of these maps, all of the code, and all of the things that I just talked about uh, are openly available for use. So this is something that people can really can really use and take forward if they, if, they, if they like to. And you can also always send me an email to sort of see whether I can send, send some examples through. 
And I want to, obviously, this would not have been possible with many of the contributions of many of my collaborators and co-authors uh, on, these, on these papers uh, and the funders that supported generously most of that work um, outside the institution. And with that, I'm happy to take questions. Thank you very much, Moritz, uh, for that really interesting insight into your world. Um, and uh, I'm going to open the floor to questions. And before I do, just one uh, administrative note. So the talk is being recorded. So if you'd like to bear that in mind before you choose to ask a question, that'd be great. <laughs> <laughs> or before you decide what to ask, you'll say. OK. Um, are there any questions from the floor? You touched briefly the, uh, you. You touched briefly the, um, the potential use of uh, these maps and tools to, uh, for vaccines. Right. And there is uh, the same mosquito, Aedes, uh, can transmit other uh, uh, viruses like uh, Mayaro in, in, in Brazil. So is there any, um, are there any plans or you have uh, already in mind new emerging viruses transmitted by the same mosquitoes or are you uh, or, or you're, you're going to focus mainly on the existing ones that are spreading? And so I think Mayara is a very good example. Um, it's until this point at least been confined to uh, I think more the Amazonian region I think uh, and not spreading too far outside that region. Um, but we are considering sort of to use, I mean, especially these maps are like openly available for policymakers to really apply to like the current context of their environments. So, um, and that always allows for sort of an expansion to these, to these new emerging infections. We haven't specifically planned on doing this for Miaro virus, um, but believe that uh, there's definitely sort of a good application of that uh, going forward. Yeah. Um, so I was more interested in the modeling side of your work in terms of like measuring the velocity of the spread and also the geographic you know, formation of or spread of these diseases. I was uh, wondering if you could elaborate more on that. Do you actually, so in terms of velocity, do you, are you interested more in just understanding the mean velocity of spread? What about the you know, out, uh, outliers basically in terms of if, if something goes way outside the spread, how do you deal with those? Yeah, sort of so situations? very good question. I think, um, so when I showed these initial sort of maps of like how quickly it's expanding sort of into new areas, these are just mean estimates of like how sort of, you know, we, we represent this in a relatively simple mathematical framework. But then for the prediction part, so we are actually including the long tail. So we are including the things that sort of spread very far, but are very rare, but potentially are very impactful in terms of uh, their spread to go long distances. And I mean, that's a, um, a fantastic question. Like, I mean, this is really what happened with the sort of introduction to Germany of the Albopictus mosquito from Italy that went over the Alps and then sort of, you know, got there. And um, without such a model structure, we wouldn't have been able to, to predict that, yeah. But we also find like interesting things that, for example, in one, model, it's, one model alone doesn't necessarily represent the process. So we put in a whole range of 22 sort of mobility models to sort of pick from the ones that actually represent the process in historically and then take that forward. I just ask, yeah. how, how did you then compare the models? We also compared the models. Yeah. Um, so we took single covariate models, uh, essentially, where one is just like taking the distance model, for example, that I mentioned, which do is, does relatively well, actually, for albopictus, but does very poorly for, for Aedes aegypti. Um, and then we take sort of a selection of combinations of those and see how much we can improve our models. And the full model always does best. So putting all of them in would always increase our predictive power. Thanks. Related to that, I was going to ask about uh, the difference you found between uh, Egypti and Albopictus. It seemed really quite stark for two closely related species, if you had an idea of, of why that is. Yeah, very good question. I mean. Um, especially in the US, you can see that well in the actual predicted maps. So what we see is for Aedes albopictus, these you know, wavefront expansions, and for Aedes aegypti, 
sort of the jump into new locations. And uh, we mostly think that this is because of the, uh, of the species biology. I mean, the Aedes albopictus mosquito would opportunistically buy, uh, bite on anything, like if it's, you know, if it's birds or if it's cows or humans, they don't really care about that. Aedes aegypti, however, wants to really, is really highly adapted to human environments. So it really wants to be in places where, where humans live. So it makes sense for there to be such more of a sort of urban to urban spread. But I agree they are closely related. But also there's evidence for competitiveness in, in Florida, especially where they wouldn't want to be. So. Hi, um, th thank you for the, for the great uh, talk. Um, I was just wondering if you could give us um, a rough idea of what's the current date available for other type of arthropod, uh, arthropod vectors that are not necessarily AD, so for example, midges. Uh, other mosquito uh, families. Uh, is there enough information to sort of extend these models into different vectors for other uh, p uh, viruses and other pathogens in general? Yeah, so, I mean, um, there's good databases now that are being set up. So GBIF, for example, is a database where people increasingly sort of put their own data on that can then be shared across different sort of groups. Um, uh, from my understanding is that there's uh, very little information, for example, for the yellow fever mosquito in Brazil. So there's still like a lot of work to be done to actually collate a good set of you know, species there. There's a hemagogus mosquito. For West Nile virus, uh, it's also quite complicated because there you have um, just a whole range of factors that are potentially transmitting, and they all have kind of different niches, so you would need to really apply new models to those uh, types of um, vectors. So in terms of the base uh, of where good vector information is available would be for anopheles, for the malaria vectors, and for the Aedes aegypti and Aedes albopictus, for all the other ones, uh, I think there needs to still be a lot more work to be done to collate like, sort of uh, example data sets for them to be mapped, uh, especially at a global scale. So, Moritz, if I can ask yeah. you a question. Please. So, so um, uh, if, we were, if you were to look into the future, um, what could you do, what would we need to really shift the accuracy of these predictions to the next level? So I think a couple of times you mentioned that you were restricted by uh, low data availability in some yeah. situations. Is it just more data? Uh, and if so, how do we get more data? Is it just, just money? Do we just need more funding? Or is there technologically or organizationally something we can do fundamentally different? Yeah. So, good point. I mean, people probably have different opinions on this. My view is that we are just lacking a lot of data still, and those are, could be very basic information about data. For example, people reporting disease. Uh, we still don't know very much in, in some locations around the world. Uh, we need better testing for those diseases, so there's still like questions around how valid our data points that we have today. So, I think if we had sort of a, a cataloging uh, of of, of data sets in a more rigorous fashion that would help help a lot. Um, we have new technologies to, to get sort of to a better accuracy or to better kind of information, um, but we don't have them at this point at sort of a shareable high resolution rate, as I mentioned. So I think we really need to go down to, to do that. Um, and I think, for example, there's so much information that is contained within digital information, like Twitter and so forth, but um, it needs real checking and real new algorithms to identify what, like, how valid these data points are. As I mentioned, when I showed this map, there's lots of points popping up in northern US, but those are not points of people actually reporting diseases that people may be talking about because they read in the news, or people talking about because they came back from somewhere. But we need to find algorithms that can extract that information in a better way. So I think it's a combination of both, really, of one, finding better algorithms to extract relevant information, developing technology to get them more rapidly, you know, people on mobile phones, maybe diagnosis that can be done uh, on mobile phones, for example. Um, and then finding an infrastructure where we can collate these large data sets that are then checked, verified, and shared across the board, so for people to sort of use them within their disease models. Uh, I have a question. Um, so. In the university, there's a um, crowdsourcing thing called Zooniverse. Is that something that could help with what you were just talking about? Um, I am not aware of that. 
So they have lots of programs where they use um, online volunteers to sift through information. So finding planets, um, right. spotting animals and photographs, etc. So I didn't know if they could sift through things like Twitter, yeah. etc. I mean, yeah, things like that would really help. So finding um, an educated crowd <coughs> to go through uh, messy information to then make it sort of more valid. I think that'd be great. Yeah, absolutely. And if that could be centralised. Jose, do you have a question? No, oh, okay. I wanted to know what it was called. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so I, I've got one of the um, uh, question following on from what you said before, yeah. which was that you will have this repository of data and predictions uh, that arises from combining all these data sets. So who, who at the moment sort of owns or, 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 or holds that repository of information? And who should? Um, should it be... Is it private corporations? Is it universities? Is there some way, some other model for all of this data to be shared? Um, I mean, ideally, I think this should be openly available, right? I mean, for me, not, none of that should be stuff that like, is uh, information that, that is uh, solely the um, of ownership of companies, for example. I think this information, with the necessary ethical agreements, of course, should be shared across the board. Uh, for people to make to make these better uh, inferences about disease disease spread, for example, um, universities I think in part can help do that and facilitate that, hosting servers, hosting the infrastructure, making sure it's valid and used in a in a way. But I think we're moving towards that direction anyway with open data sharing agreements and so forth. Um, uh, I also think that things should be made available when they are when they're collected, not necessarily after its publication, so I think things should become openly available straight away, and should then, you know, the whole sort of how we then think about academic publishing and ownership and, you know, how you get it into the big journals and things like that should also be rethought. So I think also journals in some ways have a responsibility to take here to say, well, we can allow open sharing after collection and not after publication, for example, especially when it comes to outbreak settings where things are actually happening in those moments where more people working on something would help. Yeah, I think there's a really interesting role for archives and university yeah. libraries in, in, in uh, holding and maintaining these sort of data sources for future generations. Yeah. Great. I'm, I'm curious in your <coughs> modeling work that takes climate change into account, right. are you able, also able to take into account altitude shifts in, in vector niches? Yeah, so that is taken into account when you look at temperatures, for example. So, uh, we don't put elevation in as a covert in our current models. We mm -hmm. have a proxy for that, which would be temperature in that case. So if temperatures are rising in higher elevation locations, the model would account for that and then would predict those higher locations to be those that also can, uh, are, are susceptible to, to invasion of these, of these vectors, for example. Absolutely, yeah. Do you have a question at the front? So we're not deterministic about the elevation thing. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you um, for the talk. Um, I have a, I guess, a very naive question about the data sources. Um, I, I believe that because you're working on a global perspective, you'll be collecting data from multiple sources, multiple local sources, and I assume that a lot of these sources might be very different in the, the, the quality of the data. And uh, particularly where you're looking at sort of between the border of two countries where different countries may have different practices, uh, yeah. quality of data, where you have to model how, say, something spreads from one border to across the other. How, uh, I was just wondering if it's difficult, very difficult to reconcile some of these differences in quality and, and how did you manage to overcome yeah. that? Yeah, very good question. I mean, we deal with that uh, all the time. Uh, we have protocols to go through to ensure that the data that we're using is, like, at least we believe that quality. So let's say, you know, like, we, we go, individually through the records to, to ensure that and have a protocol for that and have multiple people checking that, of course. Uh, when it comes to especially sort of the geographic expansion and we have only information from one side but not the other, the Ebola outbreak may be an example now happening between DRC and Rwanda. So how do we think about exactly that border? What does the border affect really? Are people transitioning over the border or not? Um, we have in the past relied on some assumptions, of course, and sensitivity analyses to take account of that, but at the same time, we also, because we have a global data set, we may have cross-border, for example, trajectories that we can infer from other locations 
and then put that back into the locations that we're looking at currently. <coughs> so I think there's ways to sort of borrow information from somewhere else and then, um, and then put that into our current model and how we think about the current sort of trajectory of the, of the vector or the disease, for example, over a country border. Uh, thank you for your talk. I had two little questions. The first is you, you use models to, uh, uh, to predict uh, uh, the distribution of the vectors in the future under different uh, cli climate change scenarios. And uh, I, 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 I want to know, I wonder that uh, you, you just uh, consider uh, the, uh, uh, the influence of uh, climate change on the vector. And do you uh, consider the influence of, of climate on the pathogen itself? And the, it's the first question. Uh, the second question is, uh, you, you just use model to uh, uh, predict uh, the scenarios in the future, and do you consider uh, the uh, uh, prevention measures conducted by the uh, public health authorities? Yes, thank you. Right, so for the first question, um, specifically this was like our first attempt really to do these sort of uh, high resolution maps of the vectors. We haven't yet included kind of how that's going to affect the distributions of the associated uh, diseases. However, we do know from the past that the diseases kind of follow in five to 15 years after the vector have invaded new places. So we will anticipate that if there is new areas that are becoming sort of suitable and are going to be invaded by these vectors to be those that we also anticipate to have uh, transmission occurring, um, but not in a definite sort of sense, but that would need sort of another layer of modeling on top of that, which we hope to expand on uh, going forward. Uh, in terms of your second question, in terms of mitigation and strategy and control, uh, we specifically didn't look at that in this, in this paper. However, we think that these maps will provide evidence for people to then look at and go out and find the locations where uh, mitigation and control strategies make most sense. So for example, for our uh, map in 2015 for, for, for the Aedes mosquitoes, they have been used by ECDC or other governments to basically say, well, we target these new locations where we have high vector presence to uh, sort of suppress the populations so it can't expand further or much further from there. So this is more like a tool for policymakers to use to then do implementation of, of strategies of control. Okay, well, first of all, I'd like to thank all of you in the audience, not only for uh, coming, but also for your contributions and making that a really interesting and engaging uh, Q&A session after the talk. And of course, I'd like to thank again uh, Moritz for his, um, for his talk and for uh, enlightening us today. Thank you. Thank you.